financial and social gain. Now, many this very frequent question. I know I'm asked it, and I, I imagine David, you're asked the same thing. The foreclosure crisis in many people's minds is in everybody's rearview mirror, and most people have experienced some housing appreciation and have most people have started to realize some house appre home appreciation and the real estate market looks like it's getting rosy again. The question is, are there still many non-performing mortgages to acquire? And David, how, how do you respond when you get a question like that? Yeah, I mean, you know, the one thing that you have to always realize is that let's talk about banks. You know, when banks have um, loans um, on their books that were non-performing two years ago, and as you just stated, that the market's getting better, more robust, people are, 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 are able to come to the table with some new payments, and they're starting to make their payments. You know, that loan, no matter what, is in the bank's eyes as a classified asset. So it'll never get back to the, the actual bank line. So clearly, um, I always do still see opportunities um, on the bank side where they're always looking to sell those assets because they, they'll never make it back to the line. They're classified assets. They have them written down, and they're able to, uh, to sell those assets pretty easily. Um, and then if you look at the, everything else on the hedge funds or other uh, uh, government uh, sales, um, you know, you're, you're dealing with some people that probably um, may be in a better situation now, but we're so far behind, there's a big difference between value still and probably what their obligation payoff would be. So, I mean, even though the market's getting better, I still see that all those opportunities will always exist. Now it always exists, but I think for the next five years there'll be a big concentration. We've seen Fannie and Freddie did not make large large scale loan sale, non performing loan sales until just the last year. They've started making those sales and HUD just over the last couple of years, Bank of America just over the last couple of years. So the for all those years when the foreclosure crisis was in high gear, a lot of the biggest holders were not selling loans and now they are. And as those loans are sold, often in pools of hundreds of millions or even billions, they're bought by large Wall Street firms. And those loans, many of the big Wall Street firms want the loans in the suburbs, the higher value homes. The, you know, they can be in the city, but higher values. They don't look that fondly on the low to moderate income areas in those neighborhoods where in their minds, you know, maybe there's $10,000 to be made, um, but it's a lot of work to get that 10000 And so I think a lot of those billion dollar pools, some of those loans end up trickling down to AHP and other buyers, individual buyers, who are certainly in most cases better equipped to generate revenue from those assets. I mean, do you see the same thing, David? Yeah, I do. I mean, that's just the nature of for them to be a, a big player in the market, they're taking down entire portfolios. And, you know, I would guarantee that there's part of those portfolios that they don't even really put much time and effort into. Um, if anything, in their eyes, it could be worth zero. But, you know, they're buying such a large chunk of a transaction and um, it, it's going to be part of their deal. And that's exactly where it trickles down. They're they're looking for other niche players that are saying, all right, I know you don't like these loans in Detroit, so why don't you show them to me? And it keeps going further. I mean, you can even have, you know, you can have three tiers where, you know, the hedge fund takes down the largest chunk, uh, a medium-sized um, uh, company comes in and buys, a, a, you know, a smaller-sized chunk, and then they can actually move some of the assets that they still don't like further down the line. So, you know, that line and that chain um, is still strong out there. Agreed, 100%. I will tell you, uh, just going over the slides, some of these features, the foreclosure crisis by far and away is now concentrated in low to moderate income neighborhoods. There's still foreclosures. There's still underwater homes in all neighborhoods, but there's a concentration in those low to moderate income neighborhoods. The U.S. market, over $300 billion in 
mortgages are still underwater. Uh, that's close to one in five mortgages. And I'll give you an example of a, a struggling neighborhood, but this is not exclusive to Ferguson, Missouri. Most people know where that is. Didn't know a couple years ago. Now they do. A modest neighborhood, 51% of those homes are underwater, more than, more than one out of two. And that is not uncommon. South side of Chicago, Detroit, Cleveland, uh, those percentages are the same or even worse. Uh, now one other thing to recognize is is that despite someone maybe owing $100,000, if the home is worth $50,000, that loan is likely going to be sold as a percentage of the home value. So regardless of what they owe, if they owe more than what it's worth, everyone's going to bid off the home value. And that is often 30 to 80%. If you're working in the sub-75 value homes such as AHP, you're often bidding at under 50%. I'll just talk about social impact. Just touch on it momentarily. HP in our history, we've retained 560 homeowners, 538 vacant homes have been put back in service, $61 million in negative equity has been extinguished, and $2.8 million in annual payments are being saved by families as a result of modifications on our loans. So just in investing, whether you do it on your own or you do it through HP or any other manner, there's the ability, which is quite unusual in most uh, business enterprises today, to achieve both financial and social gains. Now, if you just do decide to go on your own, there's a couple key factors. One is, what is this property really worth? And this is probably the number one, absolutely the number one driver. A property could have been worth $100,000 eight or nine years ago and could easily be worth $50,000 or less today. And although there may have been some recovery, there certainly has been some recovery in the higher neighborhoods, these, uh, some of the more modest neighborhoods, there's been little or no recovery. In fact, David and I worked on a transaction recently, and the value was, um, we had a BPO done a year ago and, and another BPO done today by the buyer of the loan, and the thought was that, well, things have probably gone up in the last year, especially since the home was worth, it was a town home, was worth about 250 in New Jersey. But no, the, the BPO actually came in about $25,000 less. And we went to the BPO, went to the sales, old BPO, new BPO. The sales had all gone down. And you know, you read the agent's comments, this is a declining neighborhood. We anticipate continued declines. So that is happening. There's neighborhoods, and that's a quarter million dollar neighborhood where values are going down each year. And that's still happening, definitely not exclusive to New Jersey. Uh, but it's certainly, you know, California has continued in, in large part to do some appreciation, but there's many other communities across the country that are not seeing that. But the number one factor you want to look for in buying a loan is the value of the property. The next thing. And, and, and also on the value of the property is your, your, your view should be um, more of a common sense by saying, you know, if, if I did get this property back and I want to sell it right away, what, what is the value of it? Because you're really trying to figure out you know, what comfort level is that value um, as a quick sale number for you? Because again, that's your, your, your comfort level on that value is going to start your whole process. Agreed. If you take back, if you do end up foreclosing on a home, if you do take a deed in lieu and you end up marketing the home, you rapidly discover that the majority of these homes are, if you get them back in that manner, they haven't been taken care of generally the best condition. Uh, and so you'll end up selling something. We end up anticipate that most of HP's foreclosures or deeds and lose will be sold to investors who will then fix them up and either then resell them or rent them out. But it is, it happens, but it's not that common that you actually get back a home which is in a condition that is ready to sell to an end user home buyer. Uh, they just won't be able to get financing because typically there are repairs and other things that need to be done. Delinquent taxes, before starting this business, I wouldn't have anticipated that delinquent taxes is such a huge factor in buying distressed mortgages. And yet, I would think every fund, every active buyer in this market has probably lost multiple properties to, or their or mortgages to tax sale. And it, it's, it's something that requires very active monitoring. And you don't, we, some buyers will buy a pool of loans and immediately reinstate the taxes. But I think, I know speaking for AHP, and I think the majority of buyers 
look at it that the delinquent taxes are the obligation of the homeowner and you don't want to pay them or advance for them unless if the homeowner is not paying you don't want to advance unless you're at risk of a tax sale so it requires constant monitoring and even then companies slip up I mean it's happened to HP I know it's I imagine that David it's happened at SN once in a while you realize whoops we missed a tax sale despite yeah having I a mean, precaution in there you know, it's it's a sword that goes both ways because you could be um, you could be uh, surprised and if you didn't do your homework correctly and, and realize that the taxes are you know a, a number that is going to be a burden on your recovery or you could have actually priced a loan and and uh, associated your price based on those taxes and you know what we've done many times is we've renegotiated taxes depending on what they are water sewer liens and other other tax mis uh, municipalities that will that will listen to you and even on some occasions that the borrowers will put together their own tax payment plan so again it goes mm -hmm. both ways you could you could actually have a nice little bonus um, if you can have the taxes taken care of by the borrower yeah, picture this, a homeowner, you buy the mortgage, you reach out to the homeowner, the homeowner says, yes, I want to modify my loan, and you say, okay, that's good, we're going to take care of the mortgage payment, but now you have 5000 that's due in delinquent taxes, please contact the ta county tax collector and make a payment plan, and lots of times they right. will. So when you bought the loan, you got a $5,000 credit for the delinquent taxes, but then the borrower ends up paying them, so it works out quite well. Um, but it, it, but like, David but said watch the opposite side. Sword. Watch yeah. the side of Yes. Title reports. Uh, there can be, as David touched on, sewer liens, water liens, code enforcement liens, junior mortgages, senior mortgages, judgments. You can find anything and everything on a title report, and it is, I would say, essential on a distressed mortgage to to get that, see what's recorded on the property, and so you go in with your eyes wide open and, and it can often be you could be buying 10 loans and well that's $150 a title report or $125 a title report but if you find a water lien that's three thousand dollars that you wouldn't have otherwise known about you can often get credit from the seller for that three thousand dollars so it does pay for itself and it's definitely essential to know what you're getting into rather than now you're looking to sell the property after the homeowner gives you a deed in lieu three months later and you're looking to sell the property but whoops there's a three thousand dollar water lien and you may be able to negotiate it to fifteen hundred or a thousand but rarely you're going to negotiate it to zero so you want to be aware of what's out there and the final final thing is a file review and when HP first started buying mortgages in 2011 we really we, we really didn't know what we were doing uh, all we knew was that we needed to make sure that the seller owned the mortgage and even though in most cases they do uh, you have to prove it with the documentation and and repeatedly there's missing documentation <clears throat> if a loan was originated by BNC mortgage in 2006 and then it was sold to Bank of America who sold it to Citibank who sold it to West um, to Wells Fargo who sold it to SM Mortgage who sold it to AHP there's a reasonable likelihood that at somewhere along the way there was a modification uh, there was a uh, assignment from let's say Bank of America to City Mortgage that n was not recorded and no one can find it and so if the homeowner doesn't agree to a consensual solution then you need to foreclose on the property you'll have to find someone at Bank of America <clears throat> to sign that assignment and that can take six months easily and so if you know ahead that this is missing you can price that into your into your bid or not buy it at all because you you may realize that hey this is to get to the proper person at Bank of America to sign that assignment will take in some cases six months a year and in the meantime that if the property is vacant it could just be sitting there um, accruing taxes and being vandalized and things just get worse and your hands are tied because you can't foreclose without that missing assignment yeah and, and uh, David any, of, any thoughts on yeah value um, of, yeah the, the top three value of property delinquent taxes top report it is well worth and I would recommend and I know I have always done is I will absolutely spend the two hundred fifty dollars to three hundred dollars if I have to get all those three reports back. It is it's it's essential. It's 
you know, it's an, it's an amount that makes the investment a lot more wiser and a lot more safer. Um, so all I would always recommend, no matter what, you, you, get a, you take the time to, to order the, uh, the property, to get the delinquent taxes, get the tie report. It's probably going to be about 250 to $300 in total, well worth it. And you might think, well, I just bought, I just looked at three loan, five loans, and I paid three hundred dollars each, fifteen hundred dollars. And because of those reports, I only ended up buying two loans, so I lost nine hundred dollars. But the reality is, if you bought the those mortgages and hadn't done the research, you could lose a whole lot more. So consider it insurance of sorts. Sources: Where do you buy these loans? And this uh, quick story: When we first decided to buy mortgages in 2010, we couldn't figure out how, you, how to do it. You can't call Wells Fargo's customer service and say, I want to buy your loans. They're going to, you won't get anywhere. And um, it, took a, it took months to find the proper people. And the proper people, really, David is a very active trader in mortgages. So David Polio, Security National Mortgage. Um, maybe share your email address real quick, David. So everyone can yes. contact you if they need to buy yeah, No, absolutely. It is, uh, and I don't know if you could, you probably can't even input it onto the system there, but it's uh, uh, D-P-O-L-L-I-O at S-N-S-C dot com. And if George is able to put that email anywhere up there, absolutely um, contact me anytime um, if you want to uh, have opportunities to see any loans at all. I mean, I have we, you know, as we've done many times with other groups, um, we love to take on new 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 clients that are looking to uh, have an opportunity to look at and review some assets that may be for sale. You don't have to be, you know, uh, an active buyer right now. Just to stay in the market and see these deals come across is is, is good enough. Yeah, very educational to bid. You can bid low just to kind of throw your hat in the ring and, and get feedback in terms of. You know, if you bid on, David sends you a, a portfolio of 10 loans to bid, and you bid on three loans, and then you may or may not win. But if you don't win, David will probably share, hey, you know, they sold in kind of this range and, and give you some, some real-life feedback as you kind of get more and more familiar. Uh, you know, in the, there are other companies. Condor Capital is active and sells to individuals. So does Gemini. So does AHP on occasion. We, we mostly broker our loan to give our loans to David, and he's the one who sells HP loans when we do sell, which isn't that common, but but we do it on a upon occasion, and and we buy we buy from all these companies. In the last month, we bought from Condor, we bought from Security National. The last couple months, Gemini this year, and these are all active sellers who will um, offer loans to individual buyers. Because so, most of the you know if you go to Citibank or some of the big banks, they won't. Um, they won't sell unless you're uh, you have a track record and you have a lot of money. They don't sell individual loans. They want to sell these big big pools. Now, how do you price? How much do you pay for these loans? And oftentimes it's less than you would imagine. Uh, and, and and here's why: if things go bad, if the homeowner does not want to sign a deed in lieu, sign a modification, uh, agree to a settlement. If you end up foreclosing, it is can be very costly, both in time and money, and those things will erode uh, the your potential profit. So, by all means, if you can strike a consensual solution with a homeowner, it will always be the most profitable outcome. But if you if you do have to foreclose, the pricing is typically low enough that you can still make money, even if you price, if you end up. Uh, with that worst case outcome. So here I, I give you, this is AHP's bid formula, it's very, very simple. Uh, and we price the same, basically the same whether a property is in a judicial state where it takes a year or more to foreclose often, or a non-judicial state where it can take six months or sometimes even less to foreclose. And uh, many people will price pay pay more. Let's say if a loan is in California, where you have fast foreclosures, versus New York, which has at this point probably the slowest foreclosures in the country. Uh, we don't make too much of a deviation at, at, or or differentiation. As a result, we end up with a lot of loans in New York and New Jersey and Florida and Ohio and in Indiana, Illinois, some of the slow foreclosure states, 
and our pricing is generally considered uncompetitive in in, uh, in general in California and Arizona and Nevada, although we do upon occasion get loans in there. I mean, this is our simple formula. David, how do you see other other buyers pricing pricing loans? Well, I, I think, you know, everyone has a formula, but I would guarantee I would I would bet at the end of the day if you looked at where they all would end up on value, you're going to be all in the same ballpark. I mean I think it's just to how people view it. I mean, for for me, when I'm pricing out portfolios, as I've always told you, George, the the biggest thing I want to know is what is my estimated recovery value. I want to know that on every single asset that I look at because I want to know in the worst case scenario of a foreclosure sale. And there's going to be legal costs, and it's going to be a, a sale as an REO property distress sale. What do I expect that I'm going to recover at the end of that whole scenario? Because once I know what I'm, what I project to recover, then I can say, all right, if I'm going to recover fifty thousand dollars, I feel comfortable buying the loan for thirty-five thousand or forty thousand. It just it all depends on the type of type of asset. So I always want to know what. For me, it's my recovery. What am I going to physically recover if everything goes to, to, to crap and I have to liquidate the property and, and go through a legal process? But and I've done that with some loans that you've shown me, and we've compared our pricing, and they come out to the same. At the end of the day, they come out almost the same, you know, percent of value. So, yeah, agreed. But it is important. So. Uh, as David just described, look at the worst case outcome. If you're still going to make money, even just a modest amount of money, on the worst case outcome, then if you can, if you can achieve a, a better outcome or even the best outcome, then you can really have a, um, a successful venture. And the reality is there's going to be some winners, there's going to be some losers, and uh, some that kind of fall in the middle. Uh, the yeah, just the on that alone, have, we we used to we we recovered. Uh, our recovery on actual to uh, estimates was always 125% above what we um, had projected to collect because, as you just said, we went for the worst case scenario and we had some, some winners in there too. Exactly. Learn the terms. Now, these are things, again, if you're not buying and or active in note sales, some of these will sound familiar. I know at least one of them will not. Unpaid principal balance, very simple. That's how much the borrower actually owes on the loan. Not to be confused with estimated payoff. If someone hasn't paid in two or three or five years, there's um, a great deal of interest that can be added on, foreclosure fees, advances for taxes that can all add up to very significant sums. Broker price opinion, this is uh, a, common, a very common report which is used to estimate the value of the property. It's typically a local real estate broker will be hired through typically a national agency and they will go by the property, drive by, take photos, go back to their office and do an analysis of what they think they could sell the property for. Uh, it's kind of an appraisal light, but it is very light because there's no interior inspection generally and as a result there can be some, there can be some disappointment. The general assumption is that the outside of the property Whatever the outside looks like, the inside is probably the same. So the outside looks great, the inside is probably great. Outside looks bad, the inside is probably bad. Uh, but that is a, uh, a pretty significant assumption, and you can have something that looks pretty good on the outside, and then you get inside, and it's termite infested, it's been vandalized, and all kinds of bad things can happen, which can severely deteriorate your value. So be cognizant of that. Next payment due date. This is next payment due date. They haven't paid the loan in a year, so maybe that's July of 2014. Many of these loans have been floating around. They may have next payment due dates in 2008 or even, even further behind. Delinquent taxes, always referring to delinquent property taxes that are ahead of the mortgage in the event of a liquidation. Um, they would, or you have to sell the property, you foreclose, you get a deed in lieu, you have to sell the property, have to pay the delinquent taxes. Tax sales, you don't pay attention to the taxes. They can easily be lost to a tax sale. In some cases, you may end up even looking at a loan from a seller that has already gone through a tax sale. So the loan is really unsecured. It's an unsecured debt. There's still a debt that's attached to that, but there's no mortgage that you can foreclose on or be paid uh, from in the, the event of a sale. So be cognizant of that. It's it, Again, it happens to everybody. The biggest 
to the smallest buyer is that they will either lose a property tax sale or even buy one that was already lost to tax sale. If you buy one that was lost to tax sale, in most cases, the seller will agree to buy it back. A launch. This is a term that if you're not involved in the mortgage industry, you've probably never heard of. If you get active in it, you will hear it repeatedly. And a launch is simply an attachment to the note that is utilized to evidence the transfer of that note. So if I were to sell a note today to David, I would attach to the note an allonge, and it's simply going to say, pay to the order of David, and I would sign it. And the alternative to that is an endorsement where you have the actual note, and just kind of like a check, I'd write, pay to David, sign my name, and now David owns that note. The assignment is a little more formal of a document in that it needs to be recorded typically with a county recorder, and it would say, George sells this loan to David, and it's recorded with the county recorder, and that transfers the mortgage, which is the evidence of the, of the debt. The mortgage in some states like California is referred to as a deed of trust, but most commonly it's a mortgage. The note, evidence of the debt, for any kind of mortgage debt, there's going to be two documents that evidence that debt, a mortgage and a note. You need to have both. NPL is what non-performing loans, it's a very common term, or industry term, just NPL, non-performing loan. I'll give a little history of AHP. We started out in Cincinnati in 2008. We had a mission to keep families at risk of foreclosure in their homes. By 2009, we had become a, a, a for-profit, but we were working individually between investors and homeowners, again, to keep for families at risk of foreclosure in their homes. But it didn't work that well. For the families, it worked, but for every 100 homeowners that came to us, we would maybe be able to help 10. And so by 2010, we realized this wasn't a scalable situation, and the only way we could make it work was to actually buy the mortgages. So by 2011, we were buying the mortgages, and that is how we ended up doing this. And, and literally, when we bought these first mortgages, we really didn't know what we were doing. We would simply call the homeowners ourselves and say, hey, we own your mortgage. We want to make a deal. And actually, the homeowners kind of liked that approach, but we later found that you actually had to have a licensed servicer do all this work in most states. And so eventually, we connected with a servicer, and now we use Security National, the company um, that David uh, works with, and they do our servicing. And David... Correct me if I'm wrong, but you're one of the few servicers in the country that will service for an individual investor who may come to you with one loan or five loans. Is that correct? Yes, we're, we've uh, we started doing that about a year and a half ago. I imagine the hope is that that one to five will turn into ten or fifty and, and, and grow. But but you're so comfortable even if it's a small 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 portfolio. Yeah, I mean. Uh, honestly, what it turns into, it turns into uh, word of mouth for relationships um, in talking to other people. You know, sometimes. And I tell you, these, yeah, these these investors sometimes will be at conferences, and you know, the the conversation of servicing will come up, and someone will be won't realize they're talking to someone that has about 50 loans, and you know, that's kind of where that's what we're looking for is that type of relationship. Good, and I'll tell you, we feel we so strongly value Security National's relationship that we've actually opened a branch of Security National in our office, which allows us to have three and soon to be four employees who are conducting the bar outreach, connecting with the homeowners via letters, via phone calls, and reaching out trying to make deals. Because the number one way to make these things work is, again, cooperative resolutions, underwriting, so now you put all this together, HP buys mortgages at an average of, of less than 50% of current values, but how do, we, how do we figure all that out? And we touched on this. We order a valuation, a BPO report from a local real estate agent. We order a title report. Right now we're using Old Republic, property taxes through a company called Black Knight. The file reviews, we do in-house. And as much as you want to win, and make money and maybe do some social good on these things, you need to be aware of the risks. And I say one of the biggest risks is inaccurate valuations. You may get a BPO that says $100,000, and 
and the property may only be worth 60 and that could be because the agent just was doing it in a hurry and didn't pay much attention or it could be a more subtle reason such as the agent did do a good report and there are other homes similar homes selling for 100 but this home happened to be in infested with termites and that wasn't evident and that is just something that will happen and it's happened to us I think it's happened to everybody and it doesn't have to be termites but it could be um, mold issues things that just aren't apparent from the street because all that DPO agent can do is drive by undetected property da damage vandalism same thing you can have uh, especially on vacant properties it's it's really almost more predictable if you have an owner occupied or occupied by anybody a property that's occupied because you know that it's at least habitable if it's vacant it the copper could be stolen the furnace could be stolen the everything could be stolen uh, unsecured mortgages if you've been if your mortgage that you're buying could be unsecured because it was eliminated or extinguished at a tax sale unexpectedly in title issues I mean, this has happened to HP, and I'm sure it's happened to everybody, is that you will, the homeowner will give you a deed in lieu, and then you go to sell the property, and you discover the water lien, the sewer lien, the code enforcement lien, something that was unexpected. Maybe because your title report, maybe they didn't catch it. Maybe it wasn't a lien when they did the title report, and it became a lien after that. In some cases, if you have a vacant property, it makes sense to actually call the municipality. This could be, let's say you're buying the property in the city, in Kansas City. You call the building department because maybe the property looks like somebody boarded it up. Who boarded it up? Could have been the prior lender. It could also have been the city and the city could have done that and put a lien on the property or could intend to put a lien for $3,000 that you may or may not know about. You can also call the water department, sewer department, get the same information. Delinquent property taxes, you really want a service to do this. You can do it yourself. Uh, and call the tax collectors and in some cases for instance we end up doing this let's say we've agreed to turn in the bid by tomorrow and the bid is on 40 mortgages and the taxes service that we use Black Knight has come out back with 38 so those last two we may call the county and say hey we need to get this tax information they will often give it provided over the phone sometimes it's available online but then you're talking to a live person who's reading from their computer screen may or may not be 100% accurate, but it definitely in a pinch, you can, the information is generally publicly available. Final one, well, tax sales, we touched on that. Final one is these collateral files, which you can be provided to review. They often will provide scanned images. Oftentimes the notes are missing, there's a lost note affidavit, there's deficiencies, maybe someone didn't sign something, there's a mortgage missing, mortgage copy missing, title policies missing often, and as I mentioned before, assignments and allonges. David, any, any, any comments on, on underwriting uh, as, as uh, potential investors look at, at loans to buy? Um, what are the no, things? I, we I talked about the reports. Yeah, you definitely covered it, and I think that people, you know, after they as they as they you go down each of those risks, I mean, that can be covered by a lot of the, the the due diligence that you prepare well before you put the offer in. I mean, that's a lot of it can be covered. So, the more you're aware of everything, you know, the closer you are to 100% of information, the, the 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 stronger your bid will be, and you know, you'll have more confidence in that in that offer that you've made. Um, you know, and you know, I, I guess on the opposite side of it, you know, really, if you're looking to wipe away as, as much risk as possible, I mean, other than the non-performing loan, you can still buy loans that have uh, borrowers that are making payments. They may not be making, you know, full payments or uh, steady payments, but you can tell that the borrower is, uh, is living in the property, the borrower is trying to make payments, and that's an asset that you will pay higher for, but that's how you lessen the risk. And that's usually a, a good way to kind of kind of put your foot, um, get your foot in the door and figure out this, this market is to buy a better quality loan, and you're still going to get a decent return. Makes sense. Here's an example. This is a loan that, that HP bought last year, I believe, and it was... Um, originated in 2003 for 164,000 by 2007 
the home value had gone up to over two hundred thousand dollars. But in two thousand ten, the borrower was laid off from a seventeen year job, and this is about the time, same time the mortgage and, and real estate markets had started deteriorating, and Aquin, who was the mortgage holder, started or servicer started foreclosure in two thousand and twelve. By the time the loan ended up being offered to us, the property value was all the way down to thirty-two thousand. That's what our BP, P, BPO came back at, and so we offered thirty percent of that, consistent with our formula, nine thousand six hundred dollars, and the seller agreed to that. So we bought this loan, and I, I gave you the numbers. I mean, the numbers are pretty small. The returns are big, but the numbers are small. The uh, he was behind several years when we received I think it was almost forty thousand dollars in delinquent we accepted two thousand dollars and wrote off the difference and forgave it and then we dropped his payment which was seventeen hundred dollars a month to three hundred twenty dollars a month which seems extremely charitable but also um, in this case extremely profitable the return on this the first year return was five thousand two hundred dollars which is 54% on our $9,600 investment, plus he's still at 18 years of payments to go at $320 a month, so that's a 40% annual return. Now, th those are all great numbers, big success, the homeowner's happy, investor's happy, HP's happy, everybody's happy. Uh, but look at it list from Wall Street's perspective. They could say, okay, well, that's that's exciting. You you made two thousand. You made fifty two hundred dollars the first year. You're making you know three thousand eight hundred the following years. To to Wall Street, this is chump change, uh, and that is why these loans you know they sell them for thirty cents on the dollar readily because they're just they're thinking okay great you can make five thousand dollars and three thousand dollars and and these small numbers, and but if you can do that five times, ten times, a hundred times, you know all of a sudden you have a a viable business model and that's how AHP's evolved and, and I think a lot of retail investors are kind of working in the same arena where they work you know to pay 70 or 80 cents of the dollar and be going up against firms that are backed by BlackRock or, or some of the bigger Wall Street firms just doesn't make sense uh, I mean financially and for, for all sorts of reasons but to buy the crumbs the leftovers the stuff that falls off the plate those are where the opportunities lie, and in some cases, a, a local hands-on investor may end up um, being the best buyer because they can, if the property goes vacant, they can maintain it, they can prevent vandalism, a lot of things that a national buyer will have trouble doing. And George, I, I mean, da David, with, yeah, go yeah, ahead. with your with your example there, even you know, looking at your numbers, even though you're saying that you think the payment of 320 is is is, is low, but just on the basis of the uh, the modification that you got for 18 years, if I mean many many individuals would be happy with a 17 to a 20 percent yield, if they took that 18 years of 320,000 monthly payment, um, they would pay you 20,000 dollars today for that loan. So you you've enhanced yeah, exactly. I mean you've enhanced it. It's, it's there's, there's no doubt about it. You, just by that workout alone, you've enhanced it. That that product instrument now is probably worth about twenty to twenty-two thousand dollars, and someone would be tickled pink to have a seventeen twenty percent return. Yeah, David touches on a good point. Just because you buy a loan doesn't mean you're going to own it until it's paid off. If you buy a loan, you you can add value. If you take a non-performing loan, you modify it. You've added value, and if that homeowner makes a few payments, maybe six payments in a row on time, then other buyers would be interested, saying, "Hey, this is a cash flowing loan. I'm going to buy it. I'm going to, like David said, I, I need a 17% yield, 15% yield, 12% yield. I mean, the reality is, some of the big buyers are comfortable at seven or eight percent yield, and they will buy these um, buy these loans. The longer the pay history, the better. But uh, actually, David, you've touched on a couple of times the market is so strong for reperforming loans right now that in mm -hmm. some cases just uh, they make two or three payments and people are pricing them very strongly. No, absolutely. It, the the we call it the RPL, which is the reperforming loan market and it's um very active, very active. It's you know, it's it's getting to a point where even the bigger groups 
are looking to uh, gather up as much as they can. And, you know, from what I can tell, my guess is that they feel there's a time where they can securitize those. I, I think that's already happening. And that, that uh, results in people paying a lot of money. So they, if you have a re-performing loan, you're, you can often sell it at a good size premium. I know one of the, it was Fannie or Freddie, one of the recent pools in, in the Tampa area went for 81 cents, and these were non-performing loans, just to kind of give you the extreme. And, uh, and the re-performing loans, I, I know I've heard in the 70s and 80s as well. And uh, considering if you can buy it at 30 or 50 and, and exit at you know, 60, 70, sometimes even 80, those, those are big numbers that, that may make sense to capture. Yeah, I mean, you you know where the 401k uh, self-directed IRAs are going. So, I mean, it's... Exactly. I mean, it would be, again, I'd say tickle pink to have a, a return higher than their probably 6 or 7% return they're getting. Let's talk about how to make money and how to lose money. We'll start with how to lose money. Uh, and we've... Uh, HP has been on both sides of this. We've tried to work out deals on behalf of homeowners with other servicers and lenders. And then we've also done it on our own, and we've tried to learn from our experiences. And if you're aggressive, abrasive with homeowners demanding money and, and being kind of a bully, it tends not to work out that well. In fact, there's a whole legion of consumer protection attorneys that will they, – that can then exploit – the deficiencies that you create by maybe stepping over the line or just stepping close to the line in terms of um, your collection efforts. And even if you do everything within the law, the fact that you're a bully will end up, in many cases, driving a homeowner to an attorney or simply maybe they represent themselves and they can drag on these foreclosures for exceptional periods of time. And you see it repeatedly with Aquin, with the big banks, and many a times, they just need someone, they're not fighting because they want to fight, because most people want certainty. They want to know there's a resolution, which is a modification, so they can stay in their home. And yet when they call these banks and they feel that they've given them documentation multiple times and it's lost or not attended to and they end up being denied, they fight back. And, and you end up with something that uh, loses time and money and isn't conducive to a resolution that's profitable. Also, if you make it overly complicated, lots of times the homeowners get lost. And so we try to make our solutions very simple, and I think that's really the way to go, requiring a whole bunch of documentation, tax returns, bank statements, hardship letters, all this to get a modification, or sometimes even for a need in lieu. Again, oftentimes that documentation, if you're an individual buyer or someone like HP, it really doesn't serve you much good. Uh, and to determine what other assets they have or what not. We, we make all our payments based on a formula versus um, you know trying to analyze what they can afford and, and trying to get as much as we can. We simply try to get a fair number, which will generate a good return for us, and many times the homeowners feel very comfortable with that. These, if you end up with, with litigation with a homeowner, it's, it's inevitable if you buy these loans that there will be litigation, and but the ability to diffuse it as fast as possible is will always be of value because homeowners are successfully staying in their homes for years and years and years and not paying and both sides pay and instead of paying you a mortgage payment they're paying an attorney and that's really a very very negative situation that that you would need to try to put an end to right away and you can put an end to it or not even start it by being very offering something that's simple and cooperative Many people will buy loans thinking, oh, this is a great way to buy real estate under market, and I'm not sure that works out as, as well. Certainly, if a property is vacant, that could be a good way to acquire the property. But if, the home, if there's a homeowner and a family living in that property, it often terms is not a very good tool. And so I think if you buy mortgages that are occupied, you really want to be prepared for both. You want to be prepared to modify the loan or prepared to take over a vacant property and sell it or, or turn it into rental, whatever you want to do with it. But to, if you have just one exit, I think that's something where you're setting yourself up for some uh, some challenges. Servicing, well, we love our in-house servicer branch. 
if you outsource the servicing, which I such as to Security National, you really want to stay on top of it and, and, and make sure that you are, even though you can't be calling the homeowner direct, you want to be following up to make sure SN is is making all their calls and doing whatever they can in terms of outreach to the homeowners. And I always take the approach that a servicer, just like an attorney, is you're working with them. Not, they're not working for you because if you just hand it over and say services and make me a lot of money, that oftentimes is not the best way to get the results that you're looking for. I mentioned customer service overseas because Aquin does this and I think it's, it's very poor practice. It works a lot better when the customer service, you have a homeowner who is customer service in the States that can deal with homeowners who are dealing with what to them is often their biggest problem in their life at the moment is trying to keep their home. Loans and the licensed entities. David, do you see much of this in some of the, uh, I mean, we hold our loans in a trust with, Nash, with U.S. Bank as the trustee in order to comply with some states, state have laws that if you own a mortgage, you need to have a license. And yet I still see LLCs pretty often. Do you have any, are these laws that just aren't readily enforced or what do you see? I don't see much of that all, George, to be honest with you. Yeah, again, many attorneys will advise you it's prudent to hold it in an entity with a national bank. Um, and I think if you go to, if you start growing, it's something you want to look into. But on a, on a more modest scale, there's really no, apparently no, very little enforcement because I've, I've only heard of occasional, um, occasional situations. And how do you make money? I'll, I'll go real quick on these because we've touched on most of them, but expeditious, respectful borrower outreach, simple formulas, minimal document requirements, consensual solutions, and can't say that enough, to make consensual deals with homeowners always the best way to, to maximize your return, both socially and financially. We often start foreclosure, homeowner calls, hey, can I still do that mod? So it provokes a response. So it can be a good tool, which you often may need to use. And right now, actually, I think that's, we're almost done with it. We're pretty close to our 45 minutes. If anyone in the audience has any questions, we can actually, uh, I believe there's a chat, uh, chat button on the right-hand side where you can chat a question, I believe. And let's see if that uh, works right here. Who do we buy? So actually, there's a question right here. Who do we buy pools from? Security National. National is one we bought, in, and I'll just go over some some examples. We bought from in the last several months. We bought from Security National for Aurora Bank. We bought from Impact, Condor, Gemini. Uh, and who who else are active sellers? Citibank, Carrington. Um, yeah, I mean, David, what what other who, who are the other active uh, sellers out there that you're seeing? Well, I mean, I think you probably put mostly what you're buying from, but anyone can buy loans from. I mean, I, I always suggest people to start even at their local bank. I mean, you'd be very surprised to find huh. out even at your local bank if they have one or two loans that are just a big problem for them. I <laughs> mean, you know, they have no. I don't think they have any issues uh, selling it to an investor, knowing that they don't have to deal, uh, especially a small bank. They may ha they don't want to be dealing with the the issues with the borrower in their own local area. Um, other than that, um, you know, you, there's a lot of even there's a lot of websites that have different advisory groups, uh, different um, um, sale groups. Um, I mean, a, a big one that I've known for many years is DebtX. Um, mm -hmm. you know, d just even doing an internet search on uh, loans and portfolio sales, getting yourself involved and in talking to those different groups, um, something will flow your way. I I agree. There's there's 
sometimes you know the local bank that has three loans those can be a, a they can price them very competitively they could be local to the investor could be great outlets in addition to some of the more national sellers and right, you can even actually, you you can even go to a, a you what we used to do is what we used to do was we would even a local newspaper we would go put an ad in and say we're looking to buy uh, owner owner finance paper and you'd be surprised that there are individuals out there that may have some um, owner finance paper that you know they've had it for a while they're looking to get rid of it and move on to something else or it may be an issue and they want to sell it so makes sense David, repeat your email address because that's actually another a good question uh, someone asked. Uh, dpolio, P-O-L-L-I-O so at snsc.com, yeah. correct? Okay, I can it, I can show it on the screen. Yep. So that's good. It's a D and is then, David. Mm -hmm. and then, so it's D is in David, P is in Peter, O-L-L-I-O -L -L at S-N-S-C. C, which is which stands for Security National Servicing Corp. dot com. Okay, got it. So we have uh, everybody should be able to see that. And the next question is, huh, David, you're a popular guy. Uh, they they want to know your phone. What's your phone number? <laughs> My phone number is uh, <laughs> six zero three. Uh huh. Six seven three. Nine eight zero zero. Okay, I, I and so I put that on the screen so everyone can see it. Sure. Uh, and the the other question was, uh, oh, can you receive an attachment of the presentation? Absolutely. If you send me a quick email just saying, hey, please send attachment, we'll send a a um, we'll probably put it on. We'll make it accessible. There's probably a link, and so we will make it accessible tomorrow, so anyone can uh, take a look or share it or, or whatever you'd like to do. Let's see what it is. What is what is actually a good question? Uh, so the, the the question is, what is the minimum limit we can start off with? And so I'll speak for I'll speak for AHP, which is simply you'd be investing in a fund as opposed to individual mortgages and our investment minimum today is ten thousand dollars in a few months it actually drops to one hundred dollars sometime in September is, is when we expect that drop but the other question I if that question is in terms of buying individual mortgages David what, what do you see as, as kind of a threshold the, the minimum investment that you would see uh, someone having to come up to buy a mortgage well I mean, you know, I, I've I've sold loans um, between five and ten thousand um, dollars. You know, t to me there is no minimum. To be honest with you, because if someone has a loan that they're looking to sell, and they bought it for a thousand dollars and they want to sell it for five thousand, I'm I've got no problem selling that for somebody. Yeah, and the reality is some of these loans do sell for just a thousand or two thousand dollars in some cases. Uh, I mean, once in a while, in a, if you buy in a big pool, HP's bought a, hundreds of loans for simply one dollar, and sometimes they're really not even worth a dollar. But oftentimes, there's also some money to be extracted. So that that is a um, that is a common. Uh, you'd be surprised at the uh, how little you can. You can often buy these loans for. Again, you're buying a loan for a thousand or two. The seller, there's probably a reason the seller is selling it for that amount because it's probably not. Uh, in their minds, it's only worth a thousand or two, and so maybe you can somehow extract a few thousand dollars. Maybe you can't get anything. So those are. Uh, well, it could be a loan in your local market. If you've got a loan in your local exactly. market, and you and you can go see the property yourself, and you know the property, you know it's worth. It's worth more to you. Agreed. What's uh, this? I this I don't know if I I know the answer to. Who is selling single loans besides Condor, Security National, and Gemini? Granite's um, out of business. So who else yeah. is there now? Well, you you again, if you do an internet search of you know loan sales or loan sale advisory or you know portfolio sales and note sales, you will. I think you'll be surprised how many people you can probably call 
Um, use LinkedIn also. You know, if you can get to LinkedIn, and you can see, you know, you, you'll if you look up my name, you'll probably see many groups that are part of my LinkedIn network that are probably selling loans also. Yeah, the uh, I'd agree with David on that. I I can think of Loan MLS. I know they do individual sales. I believe upon occasion, FCI has an exchange where you can definitely buy individual loans. Uh, and David brings up a good point. There's LinkedIn groups, several of them, where they have, there's a whole loan trading group. There's other groups that you can join for free, and then the members will put up loans. Now, you have to be a little careful in there. I know if you call David and he gives you an opportunity, it's usually a real opportunity. If you go on LinkedIn, in some cases, there's people who heard of a loan that was, uh, you know, got information, let's say, from David, and then David that person received, sent it to another friend who then said, hey, I, you can buy loans from me on, on LinkedIn, and then they're trying to maybe say that loan that David's selling for $10,000, they are trying to sell it for $12,000 and make a commission in the middle. And so be a little bit wary uh, on those sites that you're actually dealing with someone who has control over the, the mortgages. And I, I would say feel free to call myself or George <laughs> if you, you, know, if you wanted, to, if you wanted to, to make sure it was legitimate. Individual mortgages, do you have to be an accredited investor to purchase? And the answer is no. no. You can buy it. Yeah, you simply, it's just like buying a piece of real estate, which is, um, there are no real specific requirements. The answer is no. Anyone can buy. Do you have to be an accredited investor to buy these notes? No. Do you service nationwide? Good question for David. And I think the answer is yes. The answer is yes, we do. And also, um, we have an office in uh, Portugal. And we have service loans in um, um, in Puerto Rico. Are you kidding? Or per Portugal? You have a, you have an office, really? Yeah. Oh, really? I have no idea. Okay. So you can buy loans. So where what do you service from Portugal? Uh, that was an old uh, portfolio we bought with uh, Lehman Brothers. Oh, my goodness. Okay. How's the experience? Now, this is something I didn't even know. How's <laughs> your experience working in other countries? I mean, is it easier or more difficult than... than uh, it's very hush-hush um, somehow. I don't hear anything about it. So I don't think it's, a, I don't think it's a, 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 a winner or a loser. I think it's just something that was done for the business. Interesting. Here's another question. Can I find MPLs and refer them to you for a finder's fee? Absolutely, yes. Now, bear in mind, the uh, it's just like when David will find us a, a loan, we'll pay him a broker's commission. Sometimes it's paid by the seller, sometimes it's paid by the buyer. But the answer is yes. Anyone who you bring an attractive deal to will generally be willing to pay a um a finder's fee or a brokerage commission, but bear in mind there is a um, there are uh, the deals. It's really pricing in a deal. If the deal is attractive, including the fee, then anyone's going to pay it in general. Investing with HP, do you have to be an accredited investor? The answer today is yes. Uh, today, HP we're, can only only accept. Accredited investors. However, that's changing in September, more in approximately September, I should say. We will be able to accept investments from unaccredited investors, which would be a big step forward for us in terms of expanding our market. Let's just see. We have a couple more questions here. Let's see what else we have. Actually, last question. Uh, so if anybody has any other questions, please feel free to call. I'll actually put on here um, my, most of you have my email address since I invited you to the, the webinar, but if you don't, I'm going to post it up here as well. And also, AHP's number, if you need to reach us for any reason, any questions, please call myself or David. We'd be more than happy to spend some time and answer them for you. And we do appreciate 
you attending this evening. David, a closing sentence or two in terms of vantage of the vantage your vantage point of the market. Uh, no, I think you know as I've told you many times, um, you know you and I have 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 spoke to many groups that are looking to get into this, and you know I. I, I do understand that the fear factor is they don't want to lose money in the first deal, um, but you know, I think the more you keep, the more you stay involved, the more you buy or take an opportunity to buy an asset that's you know has a lot less risk, and each time you can increase that risk with a lower price and a higher return, you know, there's going to be an opportunity in the market where, you know, this market will change again. It's it's you know I've been doing this for 25 years and it changes every five to eight years and you know there's a there's a time when if you're well prepared and you understand this market you could do quite well when the market turns into um, a seller's market at that time so we appreciate that perspective we appreciate your time David this evening and we thank everyone for attending and uh, everyone have have a good evening thanks again good night good night